just need to get need to get the girl computer. Oh, you can you move them both? You have to go to sleep while you have to keep off. So we just move. Yeah, I couldn't move this far. Oh. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, <laughs> fams. <laughs> People. Arun, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and for thank all of you who presented and dropped all this deep science on Prince today. Uh, it makes my job hard and easy, you know, because a lot of things I don't have to be redundant about, um, certainly not for such a, a learned audience. Um, but um, this is going to be in um, two parts. One part is general reflections. Um, and then the other part uh, is about uh, some things I found out about the next Minneapolis sound um, since I've been here. Right. So just give me a second. So we're here to think about Prince and the Black, and the Black and the Prince, and the Blackness of the Prince, and the Blackness within and around and surrounding and beyond into the dark matter energy of the prince. So I can't think about the ninjitude of our shining black and maroon prince without invoking several very specific contexts and memories. Uh, the first of these would be from the uh, Warner Theater in DC where I first saw Prince in the time on the controversy tour and as blown away as I was by the stank nastiness of both bands, I was even more moved by the fact that all the superfly black Latino queer kids whose primary soundtrack had been early house new wave and disco now had their own avatar who dressed and danced as wildly and as frequently and as confidently as they did and was as comfortable being all that parading around Chocolate City as they were too. Uh, that would be my first live encounter with what I call the erotics of Princetopian democracy. <laughs> all right. Now, at the other end of a spectrum, uh, this question of black, the blackness of Prince uh, reminds me of the time, it was probably about a quarter century ago, I asked Mama Tate and Papa Tate their individual definitions of a great black leader. So Pops went first, and he said, to his mind, a great black leader was someone who showed the white man that he was as good as him or better at whatever he did, and he wasn't taking no shit from the, GD, the GDWM, a.k.a. the goddamn white man, either. <laughs> My Dukes, however, Mama Tate said, au contraire, that was definitely, decidedly not her idea of a great black leader at all. To her way of thinking, a great black leader was someone who loved their community fiercely and did everything they could every day to help it rise towards its highest point of development. And I remember thinking at the time, well, these are two perfectly genderized, personalized notions of leadership <laughs> models, and, and, uh, but that, you know, a synthesis of the two might not be such a bad thing, all right? And, um, and in my mind, when I think about Prince as a revolutionary thinker and as a radical actor in uh, 21st century America, he certainly was a combination of, uh, of, of various notions of black excellence and service to the cause of black justice work. And uh, we can certainly see that now he um, was redistributing his wealth towards various black community, arts, education, health, um, uh, organizations and initiatives around the nation, initiatives in, around the nation uh, in the latter part of his life, certainly. Um, so when I think about the blackest parts of Prince, besides his music, vernacular, and swagger, uh, as they resonate with how I was raised in a, um, a, what we call a, a movement household, it lies in his empathy and epic generosity of spirit. And... Um, the, the distribution of his cultural capital for folks um, who are doing the thankless grassroots work for the community on local levels. A friend of mine who's in, uh, from Jacksonville, uh, Florida, really great scholar by the name of Fradar uh, Marifa Hadley, and I would uh, direct you to Billboard today because she has an amazing piece on uh, Beyonce's performance at Coachella in the specific ways that um, uh, marching band tradition and marching bands from HBC used, right? Um, turn up and contributed and collaborated uh, and brought their very 
specific voices to um, that performance. But uh, Fredara told me that, yeah, there was an arts organization in her town that she found out um, Prince routinely, you know, just wrote five-figure checks for, you know, and no fanfare, you know, no muss, no fuss, no muss. You know how he did it. Um, um, now, this has been a very interesting week of travel and speaking engagements for me because last Tuesday, I spoke at the funeral and home going of the great pianist and composer Cecil Taylor in New York. And I mean, Cecil, um, for those of us um, who are devotees of um, you know what they call the avant-garde, I mean, was just a giant, a, demi a demigod. You know, um, someone who also created his own form of music. Uh, one of those people I think of as, um, you know, in line with, with, with Sun Ra and Lil Richard and, and Chuck Berry, these cats that went out and stayed out. You know, they're exemplars of what we would call black freedom. You know, they, they lived it. They defined it every day and never walked back on it. Um, um, da -da -da -da. So... Um, Um, but, um, so then a day later, I went out to Frankfurt, Germany, uh, to participate in a panel about the life and art of Jean-Michel Basquiat and about the blackness in his work. So it was very interesting, um, to be in these contexts where you have these figures that really complicate and troubled and expanded, um, you know, notions of blackness across spectrums. And also feel though that you're still being put in a position of explaining them to people, you know what I mean? Because the world still likes to pretend like it doesn't get it. Um, yeah, no, it's real, you know. And I mean, the thing is, like, you really have to think about. Um, you have to separate, in a sense, yourself from your own um, kind of internal recognition of, of of the greatness of these kind of folks and um, really think about it in terms of um, American mass culture, um, enforced idiocy, enforced uh, amnesia, where um, you could go through a week, a month in certain places and never hear you know, a Prince recording, you know, or go all the way through um, grad school programs in, in, in art history and never hear about Basquiat or Romare Beard. You know, um, and you could certainly uh, go to the conservatory uh, to learn about jazz and never hear about Cecil Taylor. You know, so there are reasons why people don't get it. They're institutionally inscribed, you know, institutionally pre predetermined, right? Um, but I want to say now, it's impossible for me to, to think about any of those artists, reflect about any of those three artists, and not return to kind of my own roots of development in '80s New York uh, when hip hop was being born too. And though Cecil was a veteran performer and innovator of some 30 years, by the 80s, that's when I began seeing him perform on a regular basis. And um, it's also a time, as anybody who was there will tell you, you could not walk a block in the, the East Village of downtown New York night or day and not trip over some mad black genius purveying one art form or another, whether it was uh, Boscott, Bill T. Jones, uh, David Hammonds, Vernon Reed, Lorna Simpson, Ramon Z, Fab Five, Freddie De La Soul, Rakim, Chuck and Flay, Lisa and Kelly Jones, Alva Rogers, Bad Brains, Fishbones, blah, blah, blah. Um, and when Vernon and uh, myself and other like-minded folks started the Black Rock Coalition in 1985, um, to bring it back around the Prince, um, one of the first pieces of correspondence we got from anybody came in a small green envelope, uh, postmarked Minneapolis, no return address, and it had a standard membership check for $25. And a note that said, dig what you cats are doing. <laughs> uh, who was that mass man? We, ne <laughs> we never got a definitive answer, but we had our suspicions and we knew it had to be a brother, right? Um, now, Vernon can tell you a hella funny story better than I can about the time in uh, 1994 that Prince invited him and Lenny Kravitz up to jam at the Old Palladium in New York. And uh, Prince introduced the jam. You can hear it on, it's on SoundCloud. That was one of the things I was going to play. I'm just going to roll through this. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Vernon was supposed to get, get next after Prince. But um, Lenny Kay 
wisely sizing up the setup, he jumped in the Vernon spot and hogged all the solo time. And uh, so that he not only did he not have to follow Vernon, but Vernon couldn't roll up and smoke his ass <laughs> afterwards, right? And so uh, then, you know, Prince flipped the groove onto the next tune, and uh, Vernon was just looking at him, and, and Prince kind of looked back like, hey, man, I gave you a shot, but you're the one who decided to play nice. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, it's like between three 80s rock star diva Negroes, it doesn't get any blacker than that, you know, <laughs> that brotherly love, right? Um, uh, so I want to lastly address, just in this, this part of the forum, um, uh, this question of Prince and uh, this notion. It's, it's been floated around a few times here, black genius, right? Um, so once upon a time, I was interviewing um, the grand don of jazz drumming, Mr. Max Roach. Um, and, um, and Max, um, as some of you may know, was all of the, so the first of his generation to openly embrace hip-hop in 1983 in a collaboration he did with Fat Five Freddy at a joint downtown called The Kitchen. And it was a beautiful performance with, with video and DJs and break dancers and Max on the traps, you know. And uh, Max also said something very uh, incisive and profound I never forgot about hip hop in then in, in, in terms of its relationship to uh, this larger continuum of black music. And he said he understood that his generation of musicians were gonna have a hard time with hip hop because he said they operated in the realm of music. You know, uh, melody, harmony, rhythm, these things in combination. He said, he said but for him, hip hop had to be understood as a form of um, dramatic recitation that operate, operated in the wider world of sound, right? Okay, so during that same interview, though, Max, um, provided um, me with his operating de definition of genius and, blacks, genius and blackness. Max said that in our culture, so you become a, an equivalent of a master when you can do what Aretha Franklin learned how to do in her father's church in Detroit, namely become capable of making a room full of people experience a gamut of emotions from tears to awe to laughter to deep introspection, you know, when you unleash your gift. He said that, said Max, is the definition of a genius in black culture. Now obviously, Prince's artistry, mastery of aesthetics met the measure of Max's high ancestral bar in performance spades, all puns intended, right? So that's part one, right? So um, uh, there's, um, there's a brother here, he's been here for years, named John John Scott. Um, he works at Electric Fetus. He's also um, a musician, producer, organizer here. And so when I came to town on Monday, he called me up and said, hey man, I want to take you around, let you see what um, you know, some, you know, some brothers and sisters are doing here, right? So he took me around to an industrial area and I met the members um, uh, of, a, of a group, you know, some of you may know here called Zulu Zulu, right? And I met um, you know, um, one of the founding members of that group, um, Mr. Greg Grease. And he played me some of their music, you know, um, which um, I'm going to play for you guys, you know. Um, and, but then he also told me about uh, a project he was working on with the Somali community here, you know. And both things just completely, you know, floored me, you know. Um, and, uh, but I'm going to play a little bit of, uh, and Zulu Zulu. Um, have changed their name to Astral Black, you know, um, and they've finished up a, a new album. But what I, what I love about them in terms of this legacy of Prince in Minneapolis is these brothers are building, they built their own Paisley Park, you know, because they're in there doing all the construction as well. It's very kind of typical of Midwestern brothers, you know. You know, they know how to go down in the basement and grind and, and, and learn their instruments. And then they also know how to build, build houses and put walls up and, you know, cabinets and all kind of stuff. So they got that happening too, you know, and I, th I think it's just such a, um, just such a, a powerful, you know, uh, profound continuation of this legacy of independence, self-sufficiency that Prince laid down here too. So I, and I would just want to take, you know, take my little time up here to give him a little shot, you know, shot.
need some help. Right? an electronic fan, Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, 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 that's intentional. Um, so, so Greg Grease, um, after he played me some of the new music that Astro Black, formerly Zulu Zulu, has been developing, um, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm working on this project with members of the Somalian musical community here. And apparently there's been a project, a kind of historical research reclamation project that's been going on in that community around um, their music, you know, their traditional club music and uh, dance music, uh, because some of the superstars of that scene, some of the veteran musicians and major singers are here. And what had happened when, um, as a course of the consequence of the Civil War, that some of the first people to be persecuted were some of the poets and the musicians. And they had a whole kind of uh, uh, Somali jazz and funk seen going on. In fact, when I was going uh, on YouTube, I found a performance of uh, uh, Chuck Brown's Bustin' Loose done by a Somali, you know, called a live band. So they were doing go-go, you know, with Somali inflection there. But um, a lot of those musicians um, uh, have, here, have been here, they haven't been playing, but now Greg has actually been asked to come in and work with them on doing a recording that actually brings the, the live horn element back in brings the live uh, band element in. And uh, part of the project is he's working with this amazing singer who's here named Rama Rose, you know. And so I just want to play you a little bit of, give you a little bit of her divitude, you know, which also in a sense to me um, speaks to uh, the legacy of Prince here, you know, of uh, world-class superstardom being available right here on the local stage. Yeah. 
Rose. had the bravery, the audacity uh, to uh, do a live performance of the uh, entire parade album at Lincoln Center last year. And so this is one of the pieces. a second. I just want to get to the hook. interrupt us. Tell you what, this is the interest of uh, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll just leave it up and uh, if we ever get any love, I'll leave the sound down, we'll just start with the Q&A and maybe we can All right. Um, 